attention just jump in and I'll do my best. <clears throat> so yes, uh, I work for the Dorset AOMB, um, uh, the protected landscape that covers 40% of uh, the county of Dorset. But I'm here as the catchment coordinator for the West Dorset rivers and coastal streams, a, a mouthful, um, and you'll find out a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but my um, purpose for today is to try and introduce you to kind of the systems behind the rivers, um, you know, what what organisations and bodies are interested in in the river systems and as it turns out it's quite complicated much like the rivers themselves so uh, it's a whistle-stop tour through quite a lot of complexity um, but hopefully with some uh, doors that will be easily opened for you if you're keen to do something positive for your water environment. So I'm starting off with something called the Water Framework Directive which is um, a piece of European legislation that we've still clung on to that sets out how the Environment Agency, so the body that uh, enforces environmental regulation when it comes to the water environment, how they set out their thinking. And it starts with something called the River Basin Management Plan at the top, uh, which sets out the main threats and issues facing the water environment, but that covers quite a broad geographical area. The southwest is the bit that we're interested in, so yeah, there's quite a lot of rivers in the southwest, so it's not that specific. But within the southwest river basin management plan, there are things called management catchments, and again, Dorset is the one that we're most closely interested in, but it doesn't cover the county. It's it's uh, delimited by um, by rivers themselves. So we've also got rivers that flow northwards into Somerset and the South uh, management catchment, South and West, sorry. And then we've also got rivers that flow uh, westwards into Devon East, if that makes sense, including the Axe and the Lim. But again, Dorset's quite big. There's quite a lot of rivers within it, so it's not that uh, specific. So it's broken down again into operational catchments and the three main operational catchments within Dorset are the River Stour for the east, Pool Harbour, and then West Dorset rivers and coastal streams, which is the bit that I'm interested in. And then within each one of those, they break the, them down into individual water bodies or rivers or lakes or groundwater, so on and so forth. And it's those where um, condition is assessed and um, the main threats uh, are set out and kind of some ideas of what can be done about it. And all of that, uh, as I said, sets out the regulatory framework in which the Environment Agency operate, but it also um, prioritise, helps set out their priorities within their medium term plan. So how they invest in that water environment. So that's the Water Framework Directive. Data is available online. If you Google Catchment Data Explorer, you can pull up maps of these water bodies. And on the right hand side of your screen is an image showing you know, the data that's classified the, those stretches. So this is the upper Brit and it's moderate quality for fish and invertebrates if you can see that on your screen and good and high for lots of other things but it's pretty poor for some of the chemicals that are found in it particularly um, mercury <clears throat> which is the case for all rivers in England and Wales. So there's lots of data out there from the Water Framework Directive. That's a regulatory point of view. Um, and you can access even more of it if you know where to look. So this is some graphs showing invertebrate data. So invertebrates, insects that live in the water, are sampled by the Environment Agency. And that data, that presence or absence of certain species, helps them understand the quality of the water um, from things like organic pollution, which is um, from sewage or, or the likes, which uh, eats up as it as it breaks down, eats up all the oxygen and, and therefore leaves very little for other life to exist. But they can also use what they find in the river to tell you about flow and whether it's stagnant or, or heavily flowing and what it should be. And also about sediment and whether there's too much sediment. And that's actually the graph on the left hand side here for the um, ASCA. Um, so we can see back in 1993, it was classed as moderately sedimented, but trends have shown up until 2017, it's been getting slightly better. So there's even less sediment in the river. Um, so we've got sediment and spear. The one on the right hand side is looking at pesticides. And again, the con condition of the ASCA has been getting better over the past 25 or 30 years in terms of um, species that uh, are not tolerant to, to pesticide contamination uh, are being found in more and more numbers, which is great. So lots of data out there um, helping understand the uh, 
the policy framework for the Environment Agency and how they operate in and how they classify their rivers. But it's, it's more than just that. But they're not the only ones interested in it. We know that water companies are also interested in it, another big player. And water companies are regulated by the Water Services Regulation Authority, or OFWAT, who uh, approve these five yearly asset management plans or AMPs that water companies have to uh, produce, which essentially tell them how much uh, they're going to charge and what they're going to do with the money that they get out of you as the bill payer. So that's a pure, um, approved on a five yearly basis. So we're looking at prices at the moment in price period review 27, which will inform asset management plan eight um, in 2024, I believe. And then underneath that, there are things like drainage and wastewater management plans. So there's big documents that are consulted up, upon about uh, what we do with water once it goes down the, the plug hole, so to speak. But at the same time, there's water resources management plans, which um, look at how they get the water to your door in the first place or through the taps and whether there's going to be enough left after we've drunk it all and showered in it for the environment. Uh, and other documents like storm overflow improvement plans and so on and so forth. So lots of things uh, being produced by Wessex Water, all of which we have a chance to get consulted on. And the one that's open at the moment is the water resources management plan. So how are they going to get water to your taps? Um, uh, the consultation, if you're interested, is open till the 20th of February. Just Google it and you'll find it, I'm sure. Um, you know, the interesting bit in that document is that the forecast um, for 20. 50 is that demand will by then outstrip supply. So we've got to do something about it. Otherwise, we'll run out of water in uh, 25 years time. So those are two big players. There are more. I'll come on to that in a bit. Um, but aligned to that is something called the catchment based approach, which is where we come in as uh, another interested body in the water environment that aligns with the kind of geographies that the Environment Agency um, have set up. Um, so there's something that covers this, the whole of Dorset, and that's overseen by a partnership um, called the Dorset Strategy Group. And the aim here is to try and bring in other voices and other interests to make sure that we're all working towards the water environment uh, in the same way and not duplicating efforts and so on and so forth. So underneath the, the Dorset Strategy Group level, there are working catchment partnerships for the Stour and Pool Harbour and West Dorset Rivers. They come with a little bit of money, but um, pittance really in the grand scheme of things. And, and the hosts of those partnerships are Wessex Water and Dorset Wildlife Trust for the River Stour and Pool Harbour. And then myself with the Dorset AMB for the West Dorset Rivers and Coastal Streams. And we try and work together, as I say, to get things done on the ground in a meaningful way. Um, and again, the thoughts that are set out by these groups are put into management plans and that feeds into the medium term plan of the Environment Agency and there's funding available to partners called the Water Environment Improvement Fund that can help deliver that. And then one of the recipients of that and funding from uh, Wessex Water is a partnership between uh, Dorset Wildlife Trust and the Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group called Dorset Wild Rivers. And it, that's purpose is to try and deliver nature-based solutions that benefit the water environment within Dorset. So this partnership has been working on a number of catchments over the past um, five or six or seven years and it's delivered uh, numerous trees being planted to, to slow the flow of water and habitat improvements which again will buffer the impacts of uh, pollution on, on the water environment. Uh, we've done work to improve soil health and control Himalayan balsam and so on and so forth as well as working with farmers who are the, the owners of, of most of the rivers that, were, that exist within Dorset and to try and get them to manage their land in a way that's beneficial to the water environment too. So we've I've talked about the Environment Agency and their regulatory function and Wessex Water being one of the biggest players um, and how there's a partnership based approach that tries to work alongside that to get things done. But that's that's three things. There's lots more, there's especially on, on from Dorset, which is a very coastal um, focused county. We've got flood and coastal erosion risk management. There's a group of people. Um, based within the county council that deal with that and they have their own plans and priorities. Flood risk management plans, um, again, the Environment Agency are interested in flooding of what they call main rivers, but what about the small little rivers that aren't, aren't significant enough? Well, the local authority, again, is, is interested in that, has its own team delivering on that, its own management plans. We've got abstraction licensing. So Wessex water take a lot, but so do farmers and so does everybody else. How do, how do they make sure that they're not taking too much? Again, the Environment Agency are interested in that, but it's a different bunch of people. 
Uh, I've talked about lead local flood authorities, nitrate vulnerable zones, so groundwater, um, particularly relevant for chalk. You can't just chuck stuff on the ground to make crops grow and put a bit too much on and it leaches into the groundwater because that will have an impact on what we drink. So there's people interested in that. Development, what flushes down the toilet and gets processed at a sewage treatment work, increases nitrogen into the water courses, which is particularly bad for some habitats. So developers are interested in nitrogen neutrality. If the river's um, designated for wildlife, it might be a triple SI, a national site or an SAC, special area of conservation. It could be a, an internationally important site. So there'll be people interested in that. Bathing water quality, I am sure there is more. Um, lots of groups, lots of individuals, all trying to do the right thing. But how on earth do you as a, an individual or a small community group um, get your voice heard in amongst all of that? Well, I'm hopefully showing you a way to do that, because if you are interested, it can be a, a very daunting if you suddenly bang your head against all of these things that I've talked about. So zooming in a bit to the West Dorset rivers and coastal streams. We've got the Char in the west, a little sea in the Swanbrook in the east, Riverway in the middle, but most of the rivers focus around the River Britain, Char and Bride in the west of uh, West Dorset. Um, we've got a little bit of money that comes towards us to, to look after that, but not a, not a lot. And we've put together what we call an issues appraisal, which takes the Environment Agency um, classification for the rivers. You can see that in the table on the left. Chemical conditions failed for all of them. It's not necessarily that conditions in the rivers have got worse. It's just they're looking for more things and unfortunately finding a few of them they don't want to find. Um, and then the ecological side of things is a bit more varied with some in good condition, some in moderate condition and some in poor condition. We've put together a kind of profile for each of those rivers, looking at land use and geology and, and protected sites and other things like that. Uh, the example on the right is intensive land use on the Swan, and that will have an impact because intensive land use has the potential to uh, leach sediments into the river. So we're looking at where that is and making sure that the buffers are in the right place to stop that. Um, so on and so forth. But you use that uh, as a starter point for discussions with the communities. We've had two particular successes on the River Asker and the River Char, where we've had, um, you know, on the Asker, we've got 70 people directly involved with the project, um, including eight or nine skilled citizen scientists who are looking at the river on a monthly basis to make sure nothing, um, no pollutants are entering it. And the, and the picture is of, of us bringing in some experts to look at the fish population, measuring up brown trout before they go back in the river to see if we've got a healthy brown trout population. We've done habitat improvements, natural flood management to slow the flow of water rather than rush it through the system. We work with farmers to improve land management over 15 hectares, planted loads of hedges, lots of community involvement. And as I mentioned earlier, we've, um, we've cleared quite a lot of Himalayan balsam and invasive non-native species. Char's a bit more recent, um, so we've done some walks and talks, um, volunteer sessions, again, river restoration and Himalayan balsam clearance. The picture on the right is of Tim Bowden, a soils expert, kind of eulogising about the importance of looking after your soils. It can absorb water much better if it's managed well rather than compacted and allowing water to run off just like concrete. So we're, we're offering advice to farms about how to best to do that as well. So we think that the catchment based approach is a good angle into the water environment um, but it is complicated so a summary of what I've what I've said it's complicated it can be daunting uh, but you know, the positive thing is there's lots of organizations looking to do the right right thing but these are often driven by national regional priorities and it's hard to get your the voice heard at a local level but it's important very important that those local issues are recognized and addressed but the best way to do that is through local action uh, and the good news is there's lots of help out there. I think I've seen um, Dorset Wildlife Trust uh, on the call here today. They're a very good organisation in, in Dorset, but Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group, West Country Rivers Group and others are out there to lend a hand. So my top tips, if you're sitting out there wondering what to do, um, get going. It's the hardest thing to get started, but it doesn't have to be. Lots of parish councils have um, declared climate and ecological emergencies. So first port of call for me, if I was going to do this, was to speak to them to find out what they're doing. And if they're doing nothing, offer to help. Get in touch with your local catchment partnership. So that's um, that's me for West Dorset Rivers and Coastal Streams and Natalie Poulter, who's hosted by Wessex Water for um, Pool Harbour Catchment and the River Stour Catchment and others are out there. But it's all available on the catchment based approach website. Seek out the data, and there's a few links that will follow from this. Um, there's lots available, um, so it's important to try and understand this because lots of investment is kind of 
uh, data driven. It's got to be proven that there's an issue and there's something to do, something that you're planning to do about it will will help. So that's the tricky thing is not just getting the data, but uh, working out what it actually means and whether it reflects what you think is happening on the ground. And if not, why not? And that's where a little bit of external uh, help would be good. There's lots of experts out there. For example, there's the Freshwater Biological Association and the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust have a, a river lab down at uh, West Stafford. No, not West Stafford, West Stoke on the river on the River Froome. So internationally um, important scientists looking at the river down there. Shall we, can we get them on board to help a little bit more and, and lend a hand? Um, but yes, essentially catchment based officers should be there to help and point you in the right direc direction and support you um, when you get going. So that's uh, my very quick run through um, the, uh, the complexity of it all. And the, the list on the screen at the moment is some of the data that's um, available for you to analyze and understand and help you get to grips with what's going on. Uh, this presentation will get shared around and you'll get access to that. I'll maybe put together a few more links for other organizations so that you've got that data there, those contact details there for you. But uh, don't don't let it put you off because I'm sure we're going to hear from other speakers today, the success stories of, of um, what it's like when you do get going. But that's enough waffling from me. Ian, thank you very much. That's just fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful to have that kind of systems view from from really such a wide set of agencies involved down to down to top tips. That's really helpful as opening our evening. Um, so if you can stop the sharing, that's great. Done that. I'll put myself Fantastic. back on mute. Thank you so much. Can we just have a now I can see everybody. Can we do just a round of appreciation for that? That's just such wonderful presentation to start from. And can I now ask Simon Browning, who's associated with West Country Rivers Trust and now monitoring technical lead for the Rivers Trust, but here independently, I think he's going to tell us. Simon, over to you. Hello, everybody. Um, good evening. Uh, yeah, I'll just share my screen. Hopefully this will, and then you'll all move somewhere, no doubt. So, yeah, uh, is there, can everyone see a nice map of the West Country? And apologies for those in the east of Dorset. I've chopped you off. I, I nipped off the edge of Cornwall as well to um, balance things up. So, yeah, as, um, as Sandra said, I, I worked until recently for the West Country Rivers Trust. Um, as the monitoring technical lead there. And as part of LinkedIn to what Ian was saying, I acted as a monitoring technical advisor for the catchment based approach. And then um, in the summer of last year, I moved to the Rivers Trust, which is the umbrella body for the Rivers Trust movement. Um, the whole country is covered by Rivers Trusts. And so um, there's lots of them out there. And now I, I act as a, a, again, essentially a monitoring um, advisor for the Rivers Trust. And also I'm involved in a, in a project called Casco, which I will mention at the end. Um, so the, the, um, the, the slide here shows how dense our river network is, and, and especially so over on the sort of the, the steep and hilly and granity type areas of the West Country. Um, this means that our river system is very uh, surface runoff dominated um, in, the, in the main, and that means that lots of pollutants make their way easily from our surface, the surface of our landscape into the rivers. Just shifting people around here so I can see you all for a second. Okay, hopefully that will move on. Yes. Now, so whenever I'm talking alongside a, a sort of a, to a climate climate action network or climate focused audience, I bring up this hockey stick graph, which we'll all know and well, not love, but we'll all be familiar with. Um, because whilst this is not, um, I wouldn't draw any scientific comparisons, it reminds me of essentially how we how our rivers are getting into a bit of a pickle in the sense that Pretty much everything we've done over the last several hundred years from the industrial revolution, the way we treat our farmland, the pressures on our river systems are piling up and piling up and piling up. And it's not anything that anyone's doing on purpose necessarily to deliberately harm the rivers. It's um, it's just uh, the way of life. And, and the, um, I think that's the last one. Ooh, one more, yeah. Um, and so the trend is you know, ever more pressure on our, our water environment. Um, because of that connectivity with the way we live and the way we're interacting with our, our environment. Everything we, everything we flush down the toilet ends up in the rivers to a greater or lesser extent after being treated. 
everything we put on, on the landscape, whether it's farmers spraying pesticides or fertilizers or slurry or you know road salt or tire tire wear and brake dust, all these things that go on our landscape end up in our rivers. And that's become, you know, it's a, a real sort of um uh, you know, a big a big load for them to carry, I think. Um oh, missed that one. So the, the flame retardants, these are the forever chemicals, they're persistent, you know, and so again, even though many of them have been banned now, they're still building up in our environment. The other parallel, I think, is with, with climate change, the climate change problem is, and these are, these are so-called uh, wicked problems, that um, we know pretty much what we need to do to stop making things worse with the climate, but we're still doing those things. We know what to do to stop making our rivers worse but we're still doing those two. And actually incre that's increasingly so. So notwithstanding what Ian says, there are partnerships out there. There's lots of organizations working to make things better, uh, but they're, they're kind of working against the policy landscape and an economic landscape even that is, is tending to make things worse. Um, just, I put these in just so I don't miss out any, and it sort of helps to visualize them. So we're not really talking about toxic green fluorescent sludge coming out of factories anymore, if that ever was the case in the, in the West Country. It's some quite benign things that are causing problems in our rivers. So um, fine sediment from soil erosion, you know, when uh, soil compaction, so lots of stock in fields, um, heavy machinery is, is tending to compact our soils so that, again, we get this, this very quick runoff. We get these flashy storm responses. So when it rains, the, the water hits those compacted soils, runs off very quickly into our rivers. Two days later, it's as if nothing ever happened, except you've got a lot more soil and sediment in the rivers. You've got a, you're missing a lot of that from the fields. And of course, anything that was in the fields as well. Urban runoff is full of all sorts of things. As you can imagine, this is just down the road from me. And then of course, there's the jolly old sewage discharges, which have been in the news a lot recently. And there's more, you know, slurry spreading before rain, uh, pesticides, herbicides, those physical barriers as well to fish migration, lots of tiny weirs and some not so tiny that have cropped up in our river system since, again, the Industrial Revolution um, are really hampering, you know, migratory fish um, efforts and the dear old cows getting into the river when they shouldn't be. So um, pulling up, picking up from what Ian said again, uh, that um, that landscape, if you like, of water bodies. Remember that that um, that the environment agency have divided our, our countryside up into. In um, this was a, a piece of work done by the Rivers Trust before I joined them, called the State of the Rivers Report, and the, the link is on the screen there. They took all those all every water body that isn't achieving good status. The environment agency document the reasons why, um, and. Of, there's more than 100% here because, of course, a river can be failing for a number of different things. But I think this is a really interesting slide. It kind of puts things into perspective. So all that that cocktail of you know pressures that we that I just talked about on our rivers, you can see which ones, according to the Environment Agency, are causing the most failures. And by sector, um, agricultural and rural land, land management comes out top with 62%. So they are causing 62% of our body, water bodies nationally to fail. Uh, the water industry is not far behind with 53%. And then urban and transport, they reckon is about 20 to 30%. So this is our road network, essentially. Roads drain very quickly into rivers. They're designed to, to stay dry um, or to shed water quickly. And when they do that, all that, all that stuff that's on the roads go in, goes in there. But there's some really interesting ones in here, I think. Despite all the all the attention we've had on storm overflows, combined storm overflows, so this is when the, the sewage system can't cope in heavy rainfall and is inundated and, and raw sewage gets chucked into the rivers, along with most of the time lots of heavy rain. They're in there, I don't know if you can see my pointer, they're down there as um, contributing 12% to rivers failing, whereas treated sewage effluent discharges, so these are the discharges that are uh, licensed and regulated, but are discharging 24 hours a day, they're causing 43% of our rivers to fail uh, water framework directive status. You can see there as well on the agricultural side, it splits broadly into fertilizer. So that's poor nutrient management. So that would be slurry and, and artificial fertilizers too, and livestock. So again, um, either defecating straight in the stream or causing, you know, poaching on the sides of banks and things like that. So uh, that's always worth bearing in mind that it's a, it's a whole series of pressures on our rivers that you can, that are contributing. Um, Delving a little bit into the Dorset um, management catchment, um, again from the same website that Ian was referring to. So this is the this is the three sort of operational catchments within that. That's made up of 68 water bodies, um, and of those, 12 are achieving good status. This is according to the 2019 assessments, which was the latest one we have. 
So that's 18%, which is slightly better than the national average, which is 14% um, of rivers uh, achieving good status. Um, I've also uh, delved into those sectors again for the for the Dorset management catchment. And you can see here again, it's a slightly different picture, I suppose, than nationally. It's perhaps not unexpected that you have a higher proportion. So um, I think it's something like 176 um, of these reasons for failure in total across your 68 water bodies. And 94 of those are down to agriculture and, and that rural land management, 43% turns to the water industry and 13, not percentage, sorry, these are water body numbers, 13 down to um, uh, the urban and transport. So broadly similar to the national picture. So when people say what's wrong with our rivers, it's basically farming, sewage and the road network and a few other bits. Um, of course, the Water Framework Directive, a fantastic piece of legislation led by the UK, actually. We, we were chief in, in leading its design, you know, uh, 23 years ago or so. Um, but our current government is uh, not showing very much in terms of ambition. Originally, when the directive was brought in, all water bodies were supposed to achieve good status by 2015. That was put back to 2027 some years ago, and they've recently nudged it back again to 2063. So, you know, it's up to it's up to us, I'm afraid. We need to we need to drive this stuff um, forward. So there are lots of ways to get involved. Um, one of the one of the, um, the the main things that you'll see is all this data that Ian and I are both referring to, the, the water framework directive assessments were last compiled in 2019. Um, originally, again, they were done every year, then that slipped to every three years, and here we are, what, four years later, still awaiting the next assessment. So the, the, the monitoring that's going on, the data that we have on our rivers is actually pretty sadly lacking. Um, one of the one of the, the main things when you when you look at the, the database, you know, catchment partnerships are supposed to be evidence led so that we can direct our resources into the most needy places in terms of rivers. But actually, that evidence base is very thin and it's out of date as well. So that's why in a lot of cases we really need extra data. We need people stepping up, getting involved in some of the organised schemes. You're very lucky in the West Country that the West Country CSI scheme is running. That doesn't run nationally. It's something that we developed at West Country Rivers Trust when I was there. Um, but also there's other schemes like Riverfly, which look at the, the invertebrates in a river to tell you about how healthy the river is. And the modular river survey, which is telling us now about the, it's fairly, fairly new, telling us about the morphological, so the, the sort of the physical side of the river and something about habitat, because all that water rushing into our rivers very quickly has a has a very damaging effect, but quite a long running one. You know, they've been suffering for hundreds of years, really, in terms of us altering the hydrology. That leads to a lot of our rivers being quite incised and not in touch with their floodplain, which is which is a bad situation for a river to be in. Um, and then just a final couple of words about what I'm up to now in my in my other day job. So um, where I work for the Rivers Trust, it's partly um, helping out on a project called CASCO, which stands for Catchment Systems Thinking Cooperative. This was a project that came out of the catchment data user group, so a, a subset of the catchment based approach, if you like. Again, in 2019, that, that really started to highlight this issue of not enough data and being able to kind of draw more value out of volunteers to support volunteers and to um, essentially benchmark different methods against each other so that the people like the environment agency, the water companies, the catchment partnerships can actually make more use of the volunteer data on a on a day to day basis to direct those kind of resources. Um, so it started a couple of months ago, looking at um, as eight different pilots across the country. The nearest one um, to you is the Tamar in the southwest. Um, but we're hoping to share that information, you know, I, I kind of get information in from other people as to what methods you're using, what's working well and what isn't, and also send that out again. So by the end of the project in three years time, we hope to have really altered the way that monitoring is done in this country um, by putting much more power in the hands of communities uh, so that you can gather your own data and be much more kind of um, in a position to argue for your rivers, you know, alongside those people who have who are pulling the strings in terms of managing the resources to, to kind of fix them. So I think that's all from me. I hope that was around 10 minutes. I shall stop sharing and we'll be around for questions later. Simon, thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful extension and, and interesting to hear about the, your last project there. And yes, do store your questions up because um, we're treating these three talks like afterwards as a panel so that there'll be time for questions after Dominic's um, spoken to us. I can't see you on the screen at the moment, but 
Thank you very much again, Simon. And can I introduce Dominic, um, who's currently helping to deliver the Connecting the Calm Interreg project, and I'm sure he'll introduce himself. There you are. Hello. Hi, uh, Sandra. Thanks Hi. a lot. Okay. Yeah, I'll share my screen. I hope I've got some, give me some rights for that. I might be just about. Uh, that seems have. to. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Is that all good? That's all great. can see that. Thanks a lot. And um, good evening, everybody. So, yes, I'm Dominic Ackland. I've been working for the Connecting the Colon project um, for the last four years. Um, I just want to, Sandra invited me to talk about that project, what we what we worked on. Um, and it's really sort of taking a lot of the principles that Ian and Simon have been talking about and applying them in a catchment. Um, and Simon actually did was involved uh, when he was working for West Country Rivers Trust in, in helping us with some aspects of the project. So this is the Culm catchment. It's 100 square miles and it's just um, just to the north east of Exeter. And actually the Culm um, comes down from the Blackdown Hills um, and then runs down and joins the River X just north of Exeter. Um, and the project really arose because the Culm has been overlooked really as a, as a catchment for many years. Um, other ones have received, received more interest, but it's had a lot of problems. I mean, a classic indicator of that is that Southwest Water used to extract drinking water from the Culm, um, but some good while ago, um, it just became too dirty and it moved its extraction point out of the river and onto the X. Um, so we were very conscious of these problems and, and this is what the project sort of uh, arose from. Um, we were able to secure a significant um, slice of uh, European funding um, back in 2018 um, from the Interreg programme. So we had nearly a million pounds to spend over this period and that I didn't realise is quite unusual. Um, but I hope that some of the things we developed and some of the principles we, we brought in to, into being uh, will kind of be transferable to any catchment, really. Uh, the project was led by the Blackdown Hills AOMB um, and initiated by them, uh, but we had funding from and part, good close partnership with the Environment Agency, Devon County Council, the National Trust and Mid-Devon District Council. And the three pillars of the project were really um, to look at the impacts of climate change, how we could make the catchment more resilient to those you know, um, fundamentally uh, flooding and drought, but also other related effects um, using nature-based solutions and to develop our program of work and uh, through a process of co-creation. So really involving local people who are most affected by what's happening on the river, um, whose lives are most affected by that, involving them in the process of finding solutions. Um, one of the first things we did was start working with a local artist um, to kind of vis visualise a lot of the issues. And one of the first issues was that the catchment was very disconnected. People at the top of the catchment um, didn't really kind of understand what might be happening further down and how their actions might affect people further down. So we started to we issue, we created these two uh, visualisations. This is looking up the comb, um, toward, up towards the headwaters. Um, and this one's looking down the Culm, down towards Exeter and the excess tree where it joins the sea. And just that first kind of sense of engagement involvement. And we use these images to start talking about the issues affecting the river. Uh, and we also developed some artwork talking about these kind of <laughs> doomsday scenarios, really, of what might the catchment be like in 2050 if things just go, you know, are unchecked and not dealt with. So, you know, this is two, two scenarios here, one of uh, extreme winter flooding with very poor water quality, um, bridges having to be raised above, above the floodplain, um, uh, communities becoming uh, swamped and redundant. And then in the peak of summer, you know, intense heat, wildfires, soil erosion, livestock all having to be housed in barns run off of onto into the river the you know the river deprived of water and it is, it's strange after last summer to think how close the landscape felt to that actually um, and so this was quite prescient um, but we used this imagery to engage with people and, and 
and start to have these conversations about well what what do we what do we do instead um uh, this one of the issues that's really powerful in the catchment is that the main railway line to the southwest runs through at a place called heel crossing and this is heel crossing in 2021 um, and you can see the railway lines closed and the railway line has ends up being closed about once a year on average and um, that's a huge cost to the economy to network rail um, to people's lives and um, and convenience and this is the road here and network rail are investing in the near future seven million pounds to raise the road here uh, above the flood water and encourage the water to uh, travel downstream much faster so they're putting in an engineered solution to tackle this and the life span of that solution is only expected to be 10 to 15 years before climate change and increasing rainfall once again returns the problem. So we're talking to Network Rail about how we can use nature-based solutions to, at a catchment scale, to try and reduce the pressures of water at this pinch point and find a more um, cost-effective, more resilient long-term solution that also has the benefit of boosting nature. So we're, we're very keen on nature-based solutions um, and as are, and does anybody with any sense, um, and this is the Environment Agency, which uh, has a kind of useful guide to it because the, there's, we, we talk sometimes about nature-based solutions bling, and it's very easy to just think that um, kind of throwing in some leaky dams and um, kind of offline storage is going to be a helpful thing. And it is helpful, but it's not really tackling the fundamental problem, as Simon was really talking about we need to get the natural performance of the catchment, it, the, the soils across a wider landscape working much more naturally. And that is our key first layer of in intervention is to try and do that. Um, the trouble is it's very difficult. Lots of farmers are gonna have to change their practices to make that happen. Um, and then a sort of intermediate one is restoring natural processes, trying, trying to reconnect uh, the river with its floodplains so it floods more naturally and more frequently actually on, onto typically farmland rather than being channeled down the river very fast to hit our you know more, much more costly areas like urban centres. Um, we've got beavers on our doorstep in the calm. These are the um, beavers from the River Otter, which is our neighbouring catchment. And so we're very hopeful that they'll be joining us soon and they'll do some of this work very naturally for us. And of course, they are spreading across the countryside pretty rapidly. So that's great news. Um, but we are going to have to um, do more than that, perhaps to it, mimic what beavers might do as well um, and make a, a welcome home for them. So with some of our funding, we've developed a, a detailed hydrological model for the catchment. And that identifies where we should best invest our efforts to uh, make changes uh, to make the, the catchment more resilient. And this one is the one that's highlighted here is actually about features for drought but um, and runoff attenuation. But you can we can click this different layers on and off on this map and find out where it's best to target our resources. So that's that's been a useful tool. Um, and our whole process of community engagement um, over the three years has involved um, bringing people together. Initially, we did a lot of it online because of COVID, but lately we've been able to do much more in person. Um, and just start firstly to raise awareness about the issues and an understanding of what's happening, and then get people to, to start thinking about what would work for them in the catchment, what we could do that uh, could to tackle these issues. And those were fed into our developing a long-term vision of what we wanted the calm to be like uh, by 2050 and some underlying principles for our action plan, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, yes, volunteer assistant scientists, um, West Country CSI uh, was very active in the catchment. And um, we went, I think from, yes, just one scorecard for the low calm being produced to six by 2021. So we had dozens of, um, citizen scientists carrying out water sampling through the catchment and that's been really important. Uh, we've also had people, um, Himalayan Balsam Action Group, uh, we've had Riverfly 
um, scientists as well going out. So there's been lots of focus and energy around um, looking at water quality uh, and river condition. And I saw that Simon had had the lower column scorecard up on his, his slideshow too. And many of you might have seen these before, but um, there there it's a great um, kind of community driven and inspired uh, tool for understanding what's happening in the river. So yes, all of this has really been focusing, drilling down into creating a 25 year action plan for the calm. And it's recognizing that um, tackling these problems is not simple and requires a huge amount of change from lots of different sectors. And um, this blueprint tries to bring together, I, I call it an investment plan really, it's trying to get together all the resources of all the different agencies and organizations that are interested in the health of the river um, and getting them to coordinate and collaborate. Um, so we developed a, a kind of a, a vision statement for how we wanted the river to be in 2050. And that's it there. The River Calm we celebrate is a lifeline that connects people with each other and with nature. And this is, you know, as Simon said, it's, we know what to do. These are not, this is not rocket science. And we shouldn't have, this is what we should expect. This is what, this is the kind of nature that we ought to have. That the water will run clear, wildlife will flourish, and people can easily access and enjoy all of these benefits. But we are so far from that at the moment. We've given ourselves to 2050 to achieve it. So this was another of the vis key visualizations we've used. This was what the catchment feels like at the moment with lots of maize fields, intensive agriculture. Um, the, this is looking up towards the, the headwaters <clears throat> and with the, the clay caps, the, the black down hills here, intensively managed <clears throat> and with frequent flooding. And then we went, oh, what could it look like by 2050? And this is what we imagine. It's a much more wooded landscape. Um, intensive farming has been reduced to much more extensive systems. Uh, is much less arable. The clay caps are, are now in very extensive management so water can percolate down through the clay and restore the aquifers that keep the calm flowing even during times of drought. Beavers have had their way uh, across the landscape. There's, there's ponds and there's uh, everywhere that you look um, and our, our communities have become greened up and much more natural as well as a result. Uh, and then if you go to our website, you can we've got a kind of slider effect because you can drag this across and see how the landscape changes from what it is today to how we want it to be in the future. And these sort of things have been very powerful tools for bringing people into the process and getting them involved in what we're doing. So we developed this action plan um, and key principles around flooding, drought, water quality, wildlife carbon, access and heritage and these themes were coming out from the local community from our consultations people were very keen on all these aspects and so we tried to reflect that in our action plan and we've had these targets 2050 and returning the river to good ecological condition we should be able to do that way before 2050 um, that's a that's a big a big push um, getting the 200 properties that are currently vulnerable to flooding uh, much more resilient and getting 30% of the land into biodiversity rich habitat that's in good condition and reducing flood duration at Hill Railway Crossing, uh, which is another key kind of tipping point indicator for us. And we've broken those targets down decade by decade and we, we intend to monitor how we're doing on each of those as we go. And we know that we need to establish nearly 800 hectares of new woodland, plant seven kilometers of new hed hedgerows, get 6,000 hectares of vulnerable soils into better condition. And that's our 3,000 hectares of priority habitat that's, that's also improved. <clears throat> as well as wastewater treatment works and combined sewers overflows being tackled. And that's an ongoing conversation with Southwest Water. Uh, so yes, we've managed to, through all of this, we've managed to bring the kind of major funders 
uh, into the ring um, and we're having you know positive conversations with them on all sorts of levels about making the changes needed um, so network rail are as i've said very interested in this catchment wide solution we're waiting for the outcome of a funding bid to them at the moment national highways have agreed um, a feasibility study into how we can make water quality in the catchment better working alongside them and so this goes on we've got um, the devon Resilience Innovation Project as well is currently active. We've got £600,000 um, being invested in the catchment over the next five years, targeting um, small communities that are subject to flash flooding. So yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll stop there, but I'm happy to take questions uh, later. Um, that gives you a flavor of the journey that we've taken uh, to get to this point. <laughs>